back just a bit. So this, in, in this study, what we did and what made it unique is I, I grew up on poverty. I grew up in a completely messed up family where all kinds of craziness happened. I went through a school system where 50% of the kids dropped out. Nine out of 65 people who were graduating walked across the aisle really big, pregnant. Not really great outcomes in the school system that I was in. It was a little small town. You'd think, you know, we all have these idealized visions of little small towns where they're supportive, great communities. Um, that was not the reality for me. My interest in trying to understand how all of these systems affect development and the outcomes comes from my own personal experience first, and then comes from reading the literature where, you know, you read the literature and you find out that, well, if you only study schools and you only study communities and you only study the peers, you, you explain 10% of what's going on here, 15% there, and the reality is if you look at all of them at the same time, you can explain a whole lot more. So that was the point of the study. And then the other thing about this study, it was completely qualitative. So other than the fact that it took forever to <laughs> transcribe all these tapes, because they were all tape recorded, and they were, because they were peers, these were conversations. The best interviews were like eavesdropping on a conversation between two guys who, um, who were deeply involved in, in violent behavior. And I'm going to fast forward. So just keep thinking about how, you know, we got the youth and they're embedded in all these contexts and it's really important to understand how they affect us. These are the three main themes that I think are the most important things we need to consider in crafting a solution to the violence problem and in thinking about what our young people need from us. Number one is that youth who are involved in violent behavior are incredibly exposed to violent behavior from an early age in multiple contexts, often in the home, often in the street, often at school, and those experiences shape their development in ways that fear drives a whole lot of their behavior. And if you think about what adults are doing in those same neighborhoods where there's a lot of violent behavior, adults have withdrawn, adults are afraid. So focus on the kids, the kids are afraid, the kids feel like they need to do something to protect themselves. Two things they're gonna do. One, they're going to try to connect with other kids who can help them be, be a group. There's more power in a group than by yourself. And the other thing is, is they're going to try to get a firearm. And if a firearm's available, they're going to figure that whole thing out. The second major reason um, that you have to think about when a child is moving from childhood to adolescence, it's not like it's a magic line that they cross, but a developing child during that period of time from 10 to, well, for most of us, probably 25, we're trying to figure out who we are. Who are we? What makes us different from somebody else? What makes us the person we want to be? During adolescence, what are we doing? We're trying out different things. We're seeing what's going to work for us, and we're very concerned about what everybody else thinks of us. Most adults are also still doing that, but we at least have a few things that we already figured out and we're still figuring some other things out as we age. And you know, I'm 40 years old and I'm still figuring out um, my identity, but I have most of it figured out. But I hope I'll continue to grow because I don't want to be done. Okay, so the status and this identity issues become a major issue in what provokes violence to happen in the first place because there's a limited amount of status to go around. And in a community that's high levels of violence, violence is a means to get status. Using violence, being violent, wins kids' status. Might not be right. Kids don't even agree, don't even uh, think that that's a great thing, but it, it, it works. It, you know, if you make someone do something through exerting force on them, it gives you a sense of power. And all of these things, whether you're exposed to violence or perpetrating violence on another person, actually you have a biochemical reaction while you're going through that experience that you want that to happen again. You, you, the, the, your body actually craves that feeling because the opposite feeling of being a victim has a whole other set of biological 
sensations that you feel that you want to get rid of that feeling. So using violence to achieve status is an incredibly powerful tool for kids. And then the third theme is this isolation. So isolation, the way that isolation works is the, let's say kids are involved in certain behaviors that other parts of society are going to reject. Well, if the adults are rejecting a kid, who's he going to go talk to? Other kids. So they get involved in violent situations. If there's not an adult that you could go talk to, or you know, you're going to wor be worried that they're going to criticize you for not for not taking off your head inside, or you know, some kind of thing like that, you might actually be isolating those young people farther and farther away from any supports that help them to see other ways out of situations besides using violence. So. Just going to give you just a little graph of some data. So we have about 800 violent incidents that are reported in my interviews, and we've coded them all up. And when you look across these different violent incidents, the dominant reason that young people are fighting, and these crosses every weapon type, firearms, fist fights, knives, um, bats. You know, we had a whole variety, but majority of the incidents were actually firearm identity fighting over um, status and those kinds of issues. And so it's just incredibly powerful. And the other thing that I'll point out here is about 12% of this whole sample was over the drug business, but 85% of the young men I interviewed were drug dealers. So a lot of us, and I think this is starting to shift a little bit, our belief is that the violence is all about the drug business, but it's, it's really uh, not always the case. And um, just quickly go through these and then I'm going to shut up. <laughs> I, I want to emphasize that violence itself and the way that this continues to cycle is because it's a public, it's in the public domain. There's an audience. 97% of these incidents were observed by someone else. The power of other people commenting on your behavior and how how you perform really in these situations influences how you project yourself, influences whether or not you think you have to carry a gun, it influences all kinds of things. So the fact that it is public is incredibly um, powerful. And the other thing is that much of the violence is sparked by preemptively acting, assuming that the other person is going to do something based on a presumption that they could potentially do something lethal against you. And so kids are really trying to strategically figure this stuff out of how to be safe and how to negotiate a dangerous environment. And they're not going to adults for you know suggestions on what to do because they're isolated away from adults. If they weren't so isolated, and the kids who aren't so isolated in my sample were way less likely to have you know, multiple incarcerations and you know, multiple shooting uh, experiences to talk about. That isolation just really drives them further in deeper into a violent um, social world and, and that makes it much harder for them to get out without um, further consequences. And we talked a little bit today about social contagion. It's peer-to-peer. -peer. It's this group dynamic that is really influencing the decisions of uh, young people about what they're supposed to do, how it's going to look, and um, what impact it's going to actually have on their relationships with, with their friends and, and their peers. And that really is, is quite important. And then the other thing I'll leave with and, and let my um, colleagues talk to you about their experiences is that so much of the behavior, even for the toughest guys who, you know, had committed all kinds of acts of violence against other people was that most of their behavior was motivated out of fear. And um, there's really no space for them to acknowledge that or to deal with it. And it just sort of sits there. And so I'm going to leave it up to you guys to finish up. <laughs>